Welcome again, everybody. We've got a clear night at the moment, uh, but it looks like clouds are on the way. But we hope to show you uh, Jupiter, Saturn, and a few other objects. Um, and uh, hopefully we'll get some pictures, show some pictures um, that we took uh, yesterday. So I'm now going to stop sharing here, and we're going to switch over to my live view from the telescope. And I hope you can see that. Uh, what we've got here are the moons of Jupiter. And the far one out to the far left is Ganymede. The one closest to the planet is Io. Europa and Callisto. If you remember, yesterday Callisto was hiding behind Jupiter uh, when we were imaging it. So now I'm going to zoom in a bit. And I'm going to reduce the exposure time. Turn the gain up a little bit. Sorry, uh, Alan, are you are you receiving it? All right. I'm receiving. Yeah. Oh, okay. I'm I'm just not seeing it at the moment. I've probably a problem my end. So then we have a uh, the seeing condition is is quite good tonight. We can pick up quite a bit of detail um, on Jupiter, and I'm just going to do a quick recording. So we press the red button. Um, and if you look at the bottom here, uh, we've got the number of seconds passed in this recording. We're averaging sort of 70 or 80 frames per second. And we're looking at this histogram. Um, this is the, the brightness levels of all the pixels in the image. And we want to be aiming up towards this end um, of, of the graph. So we will stop it around about 50 seconds. So there we've got our, our first uh, video grab of, um, of Jupiter. Now the other thing of course we can do, we can zoom a little bit more. Um, you're not actually seeing any more information, but you're getting a larger image. And you can notice quite clearly now the effects of our atmosphere. Because Jupiter's uh, fairly low down in the sky, we can see the atmospheric dispersion kicking in. You can see the uh, top half of Jupiter is fringed with red, and the bottom half is, is fringed with blue. But we can correct that with a little device called an ap atmospheric dispersion corrector, but um, I haven't got it fitted today. We can tweak the focusing. Oops. I think that's about as good as I'm going to get. Perhaps we'll do another shot.
So I'm probably going to stop my own video, so I'll just be doing the, the voiceover. Uh, but for those who weren't here last night, just to remind you, Jupiter is the fifth planet from the sun and, of course, the largest. And what you're seeing there is it's uh, the disk is 88,846 miles in diameter, and you get 11 Earths strung across uh, Jupiter's disk. It's probably one of the first planets we formed from the solar nebula, um, and it's composed 90% of hydrogen, 24% helium, with traces of, of methane and ammonia. And we think the methane and ammonia give rise to the colour, the red colour we see in the red spot. Now, the great red spot was on view last night, but it's around the other side of the planet currently, so we afraid we won't see that tonight. Okay, so um, while the sky is still clear, I'm now going to come out of that mode. So there's our little planets, uh, just, a, just a three second shot showing the Galilean moons discovered by Galileo soon after he invented the telescope, I reckon about 1609. So we'll now switch over to Saturn. And for those who weren't here yesterday, the telescope's been controlled by a little um, computer that rides on it, a Raspberry Pi computer called an ASI Air Pro. Um, so that has its database on, in its memory banks and is telling the uh, telescope um, where to point. The mount will salute the target position and then it will uh, validate its position. It will take a quick photograph and uh, it takes a few seconds to validate it's on target. So there we have Saturn, um, and you see the little moons around it. The brightest one above it will be Titan, and then we have Tethys, Rhea, um, and Dione. I'm not quite sure what order they're in, but perhaps we can find out later. So well, I'll go now into video mode. And Saturn's a little bit bright there, dimmer than Jupiter. So we need to increase the exposure. Increase the gain a bit. And we'll just center it in the field of view. Um, you can see now the probably needs to have a little bit more exposure. We're looking at the histogram at the bottom. I'm going to turn the gain up. Probably better seeing conditions than last night. You can clearly see a little dark rim between the uh, ring A and ring B um, of, uh, of Saturn. That's the Cassini division. Um, discovered by Giovanni Cassini in uh, 1675. Again, we've got atmospheric dispersion. There's a, a red tinge at the top and a blue tinge at the bottom. Going to take a little video clip now. But I'm hopeful that uh, image should process quite well. We should see a fair amount of detail in the rings. You can also notice... Uh, little shadow, a shadow of the globe on the rings. So the rings appear to end at that point, but really they are in uh, shadow at that point, and the sun will be shining down on this way. Um, this is an inverted 
view of Saturn. Um, astronomical telescopes generally show Saturn at the top. So this will be the north pole of, of Saturn. And so we're seeing the northern hemisphere um, displayed. Now again, we can zoom in. I don't think we'll get much more detail, but generally speaking, a, a high pressure system tends to give us quite good seeing conditions, um, particularly if it's slightly misty or murky. Um, observing through a, a fog or a mist tends to settle the atmosphere. Right, so that's the two gas giants. Um, Alan, do you want to show any pictures you took last night? Yes, I can do. Um, if I can share my screen. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm currently sitting in the comfortable warmth of uh, my study upstairs and uh, using a uh, program called Team Viewer to connect to the uh, laptop, which is connected to my, my various kit. Um, I'll show you a photograph, another elderly photograph of what my, my kit's like. Uh, this one's a few years old, just uh, ignore the, uh, the bucket and mop out outside there. Um, what I've got here is uh, a fixed pier sitting at about a quarter of a tonne of concrete to keep it stable. And then the equatorial mount is, is the white bit here. And then uh, on top of that, there are uh, a couple of, of telescopes. Uh, the, the main one for imaging is a 70 uh, millimeter refractor that's much smaller telescope than the one David showed uh, but that's the kind of size we tend to like for doing uh, sort of deep space images nebula galaxies uh, that, that kind of thing uh, in parallel with that is a second telescope which is a 66 millimeter uh, which I use for guiding which I'll explain in just a moment. And then on, on the bottom of these, uh, these are rather elderly shots. So both of these cameras have been replaced. Um, the red one uh, takes uh, long exposures to um, record the, the image you're interested in. And the blue one, which has now also been replaced, uh, is, uh, is runs much faster. And every few seconds, it takes a shot uh, which is then used uh, for guiding. Uh, the other thing that's on there is, is just a guide scope, although I don't actually bother with that now. Um, it's festooned with all these cables, which I must admit are a lot tidier the way I have them now, going down into a transformer box connected to the mains. Then it all goes along, you can see a laptop uh, in a box there, and that's what I'm connected to with, with Team Viewer. So that's the kit I've got. Um, and uh, what uh, I've been using for that is um, a program called um, SharpCap. Uh, I was using something totally different uh, for image capture until just a couple of days ago uh, when they put a new release in. And I'll explain a bit more about SharpCap uh, in just a minute. We'll see how the time goes. If, if David gets some nice clear sky, uh, I'll come off that. So last night uh, when we had our Zoom session, it was uh, very cloudy uh, where I am. I'm, I'm just the other side of Exeter and it didn't actually clear up until after nine o'clock. Uh, it went lovely. So I spent uh, a few hours happily um, getting stuff there. So what kind of things was I doing? Um, I was looking at a galaxy called M33, the Triangulum Galaxy. 
and uh, I'll explain a bit more about it as I, I go. When uh, you first uh, take images, uh, there's, there's very little detail to be seen in them. Uh, I, I finished up taking uh, nearly 20 images. I had to throw two of them away because they had satellite trails across them. Um, and I hadn't set it up to uh, ignore those. Um, so that they then get processed afterwards uh, uh, to, to stack them, uh, get the signal to noise ratio sorted out. Uh, take out any bits and pieces and uh, you, you finish up with um, a, a, a file, uh, a, a, an image, which um, again doesn't look like very much. Um, it uh, doesn't, doesn't really show much. Well, you know, where's the galaxy? Well, you, you may be able to just see a very faint blob in there. Uh, so that needs to be stretched. And what we frequently use for doing that is use a program called Fitz Liberator. And uh, that enables you to uh, produce something uh, like this. I should have actually used a, a live version of Fitz Liberator to show how it's done, but let, let, let's not worry about that and we'll come on later. So what we can see here um, is this galaxy. Uh, it's uh, 2.73 million light years away. Um, it's the third largest galaxy in what's called the local group. Andromeda uh, is, is the biggest one, the Milky Way is second biggest, and this is the third biggest. Um, and it is just about visible to the naked eye under very, very good connect, uh, conditions. It's a small spiral galaxy. Um, when I say small, it's still got an awful lot of stars in it. Uh, it's about uh, 50, 50 billion solar masses, so you know, more, more than that number of stars are in there. Uh, and it's about 60,000 light years across, rather somewhat smaller um, than we've got here. So once I had uh, produced this um, stretched image, um, I then put it into um, Photoshop and uh, had a bit of a, a mess about with it just to tweak the image somewhat in that fashion. Uh, now it's all done in um, monochrome, just straight uh, luminosity. Uh, what I would normally then do is go on to use um, filters and you can use red, green, blue filters, or what I tend to use is uh, narrow band filters so that they look at a very limited part of the um, spectrum. Oh, well, internet connection is unstable, it's telling me. Hope you can still catch that. Yeah, um, still there. Still there, right? Okay. Um, now here's one uh, a, a version of M33 that I did back in 2017, um, and as you can see there, getting much more colour into it, sort of blues and reds, etc. Uh, and this was all done with these narrow band images. So uh, if I was to persevere with this one. Um, the, the one I was doing last night, I could continue to add mode. One of the great things about um, imaging is you can continue to add more and more data, more, you know, you can go back after, you know, the following day or the following year in actual fact. In some cases, I do various projects that uh, where I go back and add more data uh, a year or two, even two years later uh, to the, the, the stuff I've done before. Um, so that's the... Um, the image that I got from last night, and uh, hopefully I'll be able to add a bit more to it tonight. It's uh, it's still fairly cloudy um, outside. I, I sort of thought I was going to be able to make a start, but then it uh, it died on me. Um, David, do you want me to show the uh, the software I'm using? Uh, yes, carry on if you like. Yeah. Okay. Um, the main uh, capture software is something called SharpCap, and uh, this uh, is something which I hadn't actually made much use of before. I was using a, a different capture software um, until the, uh, the latest version came out, and I only downloaded it a couple of days ago. Um, but what you set up is you, you have your camera and you tell it... Uh, what sort of length of exposure? Now, now last night I was I was using five minute exposures, three hundred seconds. So that was twenty times three hundred seconds. Uh, do the math for yourselves. 
um, of, of light getting in. I've just got it uh, uh, as a, a quickie here. And if I do what's called a framing shot, uh, it says exposure in progress for 10 seconds. It tells me down here it's exposing. Um, and then it'll come up with either a thick mass of cloud or possibly, oh, it actually shows some stars. That's quite nice. Um, the um, other things about the, uh, the, the, the camera, you, uh, you set it up to, it, it cools down because to cut down on electronic noise. Um, so uh, I've, I set a target temperature of minus 22, 20 degrees centigrade. It's currently minus 18 um, at the moment. Um, then pre-processing, um, this, this is uh, something that gets done uh, for darks and flats. Now, darks are where you take images with the lens cap on, which may seem a strange thing to do, but it shows up uh, little um, errors, little um, single pixels that have, have got errors because of electronic noise or just the, the chip. There's always a few errors. So uh, darks are a way of, of um, circumventing that. Flats uh, are very short exposures with even light. Could be anything from hanging a white t-shirt over it in bright sunshine or using a, an electronic flat panel. And that is to get rid, uh, a technique to get rid of things we call dust bunnies. In fact, my uh, lens, my, my camera has got some appalling marks on it, which I, I suspect I may need to get some maintenance done on it. Uh, but using these flats uh, gets rid of nearly all of that. Uh, further on down, let's just close these ones up for a minute. Um, you can sort of stretch the, the histogram a bit. There you go, it's, it's moving stuff. Um, it's a bit of a blob in the middle there because uh, I'm using just a short exposure. Um, okay, so, so that's the kind of, of uh, things you can do with the actual um, software to, uh, to, to record stuff. Now, what other bits of software um, are there in here? I think last night David was showing um, plate solving. Um, so with this one, you've got uh, devices that, so that you decide what you want to look at, tell your software, I've got another piece of software that I'm using to actually say, what, where do I want the thing to point at? And uh, I use one called Cart de Ciel. Um, so uh, I tell it to uh, point at M33 and uh, then do some you know, uh, uh, short images, which then get processed and automatically swing the, the telescope mount round uh, so it's more um, accurately placed. Uh, this one here is a, a electronic focuser. Uh, so I can actually tweak the, fo the focus on the main, uh, main uh, telescope camera up and down a bit, uh, very, very sensitively. Another very important piece of the software is um, for guiding. I mentioned the guide scope. Now, <laughs> here's what I was doing a, a few minutes ago until the clouds rolled over. You, you, you home in, you sort of start this going, and um, let's see if it comes up with a... No, uh, there's, there's nothing, nothing visible that's lost it. Uh, let's stop that altogether. Start looping. No, it can't, it can't find a, a decent star to, to home in on. Um, so um, the, what this one does is um, tweaks the position of the mount a, a tiny amount. Ideally, you're trying to get down to maybe less than an, an arc second of, uh, of inaccuracy. Um, and that that's, uh, overcomes any, any slight ongoing errors actually in the mount. So that's how I would be doing it were it clear enough to be able to get away with it. So uh, back to you then, David. <laughs> Thanks very much, Alan. Uh, right, if you'd like to stop sharing. There we go. And I'll go back to my iPad screen. And this is another view. This is, we're now on Neptune. 
It's just taking three second shots. Neptune was we proved a, a bit too faint for videoing. Um, but the interesting thing about Neptune, of course, is its tiny little moon, Triton. Let's darken the background sky a bit. Um, Neptune, of course, is the eighth and furthest planet from the sun now that poor old Pluto's been dem demoted. Um, and it has a 164 year orbit um, around the sun, and it's about 30 astronomical units distant. So that's 30 times the Earth sun distance. Um, the discovery was quite amazing. It was discovered, its position was predicted by the French mathematician Leverrier, um, who, uh, but the person who actually discovered it was Johann Galli from Berlin um, Observatory. And he discovered it about a degree from the predicted position that uh, Leverrier had given him. So it's always said that uh, Neptune was discovered by the point of his pencil. Now, the little moon you can see there to the left of it, that's moved around, it was around the other side um, yesterday, is this curious little world, Triton. Um, and although, of course, we can't see it, the little flybys that have passed by saw these amazing geysers of, and they was, reckon it was nitrogen gas ablating and causing these dark markings on the moon. Um, Triton is also believed to be a captured Kuiper belt object. It uh, rotates around uh, Neptune in the opposite direction of all the other moons rotate around their planets. So, okay, we'll stop there. So we've now done all the gas giants. Uranus is unfortunately behind the trees, so I can't show you that. So the moon uh, is, is gone. So what we will do now, we will go for some deep sky objects. And the first one I'm going to look at is an object called Messier 57. This is the famous ring nebula. So the telescope is now slewing to it. And what you're seeing here, or will see, is a little tiny smoke ring uh, representing the remnants of a star that went nova. So this is probably going to be the likely outcome of our sun in about 5,000 million years. It blows out its outer atmosphere and leaving behind a little tiny star, a white dwarf star, uh, which you, we should be able to spot tonight. So it's now plate solving. Slightly off target, so it's repositioning itself. Having another go. And it's confirmed. So um, there we go. That's a little three second exposure. So what we will do, we'll go on auto run mode. We'll take a series. Um, there we go. We'll go on live mode again. That's a mistake I made yesterday. So what it's going to do is going to take a, a stack of 30 second exposures like we did yesterday. Um, I'm now going to turn on the auto guider. 
So this is a little uh, telescope riding on the main telescope. It's got a wider field of view. Just above top center, you can see the little ring nebula there. I'm going to press the target button. So it's now put little rings around the stars. It's multi-star guiding. And we hope the guiding settles down. And we'll press the go live button. So this sequence will stack 30 second shots on one on, on top of one another. And hopefully they will all align. So that's the 30 second shot. I can darken the background sky with these sliders. It's a very colorful little object. It's one of the favorite targets for uh, amateur astronomers. Um, and you can see there, there's two little stars right in the center. Uh, the central one um, is the white dwarf. And it's blown out its outer atmosphere. It's a very colorful object. The red is caused by um, hydrogen alpha, and the bluey green is caused by um, emissions of, of O3, oxygen 3. Now, in time, of course, this uh, whole gaseous bubble will get bigger. Um, and it will expand and disperse and just leave um, the white dwarf behind. And we can see other examples of supernova remnants, we call them, um, in various stages of dissipation. Um, there's a famous one, um, the Veil Nebula in Cygnus, which is a giant bubble, but we just see the outer extremities of that. That's a lot, lot older, of course, than... Um, this one, the Ring Nebula. You could possibly also see just above, I get my mouse to work, here there's a little galaxy just beginning to appear. That's a far more remote star system. Um, that would be outside our own Milky Way galaxy, but of course the, the, the Ring Nebula and all the stars you can see here are all part of our Milky Way system. So we now stack um, five images. We'll do as we did yesterday. We'll go to 10 and then I'll save the image. It's doing a reasonable job of guiding. Um, the stars, uh, you want to keep fairly pinpoint and round so they don't look too bad. So if you want to find this object, it's quite high overhead at the moment, just, uh, just past the meridian. It's uh, in uh, the constellation of Lara, 
Um, that little parallelogram shape of stars. And it's about 2,200 light years away. A whole bubble of gas stretching from side to side is about 1.3 light years. A ray of light would take over a year just to traverse um, that nebula. Visible in small telescopes, just about visible in a uh, pair of binoculars if you've got a quite a large pair of binoculars. I guess it looks more like a star in a pair of binoculars. Okay, well, this is the last shot. And we'll stop there. And we'll save that. Okay, so as we're in that part of the sky, um, what we'll do now, we'll go and see another um, nebula. Go to preview. We'll go to another uh, messier object. This one is, will be a slightly larger planetary nebula called the Dumbbell Nebula. Okay, let's do a short 10 second exposure and see if we're on target. Slightly off target, so I'm going to manually, well, we can plate solve it. Sync can go to M27, so hopefully it's going to put it right in the centre now. You can see that this is a larger object, the M57. Okay, so it's now centred, so we'll go in live mode again we will okay and this is the field of view through the finder telescope or the guide telescope you see the dumbbell just above center press the crosshairs start guiding Normally takes uh, 10 or 15 seconds for the guiding to settle down. We want to keep the little red and the blue uh, lines as near to the zero point as we can. And press, again we'll take 30 second shots and we'll do 10 of them.
So this little planetary is in the constellation of Bulpecula, the fox. It's about 1360 light years away. So uh, talk about fairly big distances, but of course not in terms of the, the universe. This will be a, a fairly nearby object in our Milky Way galaxy. First discovered by Charles Messier in 1764, and is often named the Apple Core Nebula, as you'll see by now dark in the background sky. Brighten it. You can see why it's called the Apple Core Nebula. Again, we've got the colours of the, the red being hydrogen alpha and the greeny blue being O3, the remnants of that stellar explosion. And the little star in the centre here, um, you can see just here. Um, that will appear quite blue. It's quite a blue star. So I'm guessing the colour of a star shows us its temperature. So blue stars are generally very hot, about 25,000 um, degrees um, centigrade. Uh, red stars are cooler, and they're about between um, three and 4,000 degrees centigrade on their surface, that is. Very deep exposures of this object show a lot of extensive nebulosity um, right out beyond the periphery of, of what you can see, sort of coming right out here. But you need very deep exposures to show that. So we've now stopped stack five. So what you're looking at here is the ultimate fate of our sun. When the sun goes nova, Earth will be a little fried object fairly near the, the, the central part of that, uh, that object. All life, I fear, will be extinguished unless by then we have got the capabilities of traveling out to the stars. But you don't want to be near a, a star when it goes nova. There's a lot of harmful radiation. Uh, we believe that a supernova went off um, near to the Earth within about, ooh, I suppose, 20 or 30 light years. Um, it would cause a lot of problems uh, for life on Earth. So one more to go.
Okay, and we'll save that. Okay, so we've seen two planetary nebula of about more or less the same size. What I'm going to show you now is what actually happens to these in a period of about oh, five or six thousand years. So we're going to exit that. We're going to go to Um, I hope I got the right number here. <laughs> so we're going to look part of the Veil Nebula. I need to turn the guiding off. Let's do a short exposure and see where we've got to. Okay, let's do a longer exposure, do a 30 second shot. Um, now this is obviously a, it's a large object. Uh, it won't be a little circular patch. We're just seeing a long wispy streak of material. The, the whole uh, nebula around the star is dissipating out into space. It's all uh, recycled. Okay, you can see a little bit of streakiness um, along here. I'm going to just try and get it a bit more central. Do one more shot. And plates all again. I think why wouldn't plates all because I still had the guider uh, running, so it wasn't happy about moving the telescope. I'll try now. Uh, 
Okay. So if we put on the guider again. Okay, it's chosen a central star. We'll go on live. And we do 30 second shots again. And what you begin to see is this wispy material going from bottom left to top right. Uh, when you've built up a few images, you'll see it's in two colors. It's again the red of the hydrogen alpha and the uh, greeny blue from the O3. So the whole object is it's a big circular patch of, of uh, nebulosity, probably larger than the apparent size of the full moon. So we're just seeing a little part of that great ring of nebulosity. You get a, a better effect of the size of this thing if you use a uh, so the 135 camera lens or something, a short focus telescope, uh, rather than a 2000 millimeter uh, telescope that we're using at the moment. So we're only seeing a tiny part of this object. You find uh, 30 seconds is enough, David. Uh, I, uh, I found I needed to use nearly four or five minutes for. Uh, for the oh, demo. yeah, but that, well, we we're just doing a live demo. So I didn't yeah. want you to keep you all waiting <laughs> three or four <laughs> minutes for each image. <laughs> yeah. But we'll see. It's stacking them. So it's stacked two. I think you begin to see the color coming up now. It's rather a nice object to look at visually um, through a telescope. We can use um, O3 filters through, uh, attached onto your eyepiece of your telescope, uh, and you can see this nebulosity appears um, just like a photograph. It's quite astounding, really, seeing how diffuse it all is. On the other side, this is the eastern part of the Veil Nebula. On the western side, um, it passes through a, a quite a bright star called 62 Cygni. Um, and it looks like a witch's broom, hence it's called the Witch's Broom Nebula. And the little bit in the center is called Pickering's Wisp. It's a little triangular shaped patch of nebulosity named after the famous American astronomer, Edward Pickering. Yeah, I've, I've got a, a couple of shots of both East and West Vale um, that I took a couple of months ago, if you want to show Oh, yeah, there. well, let's, let's see them, uh, Mike. I'm going to stop sharing. Yeah, it's... Uh, I, uh, so I had, to, I had to take four or five uh, uh, minute shots for, for most of these. Um, yeah, okay, just start sharing. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, share screen. There we go. Right. Can you see that? That was here, the Eastern Vale. There we go. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah. Um, uh, that was actually uh, two shots that I then uh, merged together to because uh, it, it's so huge I couldn't get it all into one uh, one shot. Uh, and that was the uh, where uh, this was the uh, uh, the very which hot is true. star in the middle, yeah, which uh, came out uh, came out quite quite nicely. But both uh, these these were taken with a uh, uh, a six inch um, uh, uh, reflector telescope uh, and my DSLR camera on the back of it. Um, each each of these shots were. Uh, either, either four or five minutes uh, in length, um, and uh, I, I was using a uh, uh, what's called a quad band filter. It uh, it fil filters out the um, uh, hydrogen alpha, hydrogen beta, um, O3, and also the sulfur. So it's it's very good for um, uh, nebulae and that sort of stuff. So uh, anyway, um, do you? Do you want me to show any anything from last night, or is that? Yeah, I do. If you, yeah, if you've I've, some I've, of your I've got, from last I've night. got them here. Oh, hang on, that <laughs> these these were uh, taken a, a couple of months ago. That was that was M M one. That that's the Crab Nebula, uh, which you were you were you were talking about. Um, uh, th this is a th this was actually a, a star that went supernova in uh, thirteen sixty, I think it was. That was ten fifty four. All oh, right. Okay. Um, and it was uh, seen by the, the by the Chinese. Interesting thing is that over a period of the last twenty years, they've taken shots of it, and you can actually on the internet you can actually see a, a movie, and you can see the the whole of the thing expanding, which is uh, it's quite impressive. Um, the uh, uh, that that was the pillars of creation. Um, uh, it's called the uh, uh, Eagle Nebula. Um, and uh, as you can see, it looks like a, an eagle with its claws and so on. Um, right, where did I go? Sorry, I'm going the wrong way. Uh, yeah, that this was um, uh, night before last. Uh, I took uh, a shot of um, uh, Jupiter, um, but that, that was through the through the main uh, uh, the main uh, uh, telescope. Uh, got some little ovals there in in the south temperate belt. Yes, yeah, it came came out. It, it was really quite stable. stable I think that was a view we we had tonight. Actually, that that I think that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, sorry, I've gone the wrong way. Um, that was Saturn. It was so f so far down on the uh, close to the horizon. You could see all the uh, uh, the uh, chromatic. Uh, Problems uh, getting getting the reds and the blues and uh, uh, coming at, at different angles through the atmosphere. Um, uh, now that that's what I took last night. Uh, that now that was just done with uh, my DSLI camera and a, and a two hundred mil uh, telephoto lens. Uh, it was a, a, a something like 30, uh, 30 shots. Uh, stacked. Uh, the, uh, that's the uh, Andromeda galaxy, and you can see the uh, the other little. Uh, uh, I think I think that's uh, is that N thirty three. I'm not quite sure. Uh, N thirty two or NGC ten. Oh, yeah, and I think N thirty three is actually off off the uh, the screen. That's way off. And that I I had a. Um, uh, a camera with a fisheye lens, just sitting sitting in the garden, taking about, uh, I think it was about 500 shots of 30 seconds, uh, just to get the uh, uh, the Milky Way in. So, uh, as you can see, we've got rather a lot of light pollution around the area, and the uh, the curve over the top here is the uh, um, power cable that runs down the side of my uh, uh, side of the road. 
but uh, that that came out quite nicely, surprisingly, uh, with the uh, the amount of uh, light pollution we've got. Anyway, that's uh, that was uh, uh, what I took last night. So. Thanks, Mike. If I can just share very very briefly um, on the uh, the Veil Nebula, uh, press the share screen. Um, this was something that popped up on um, YouTube just, just a few days ago. It's a guy who's done a wow. you know, three-dimensional oh, wow. image of wow. the Veil Nebula. So you, see the very, but you can set, certainly see how it's a, you know, a, sphere, a globular sort of uh, structure. Um, but the, the bits that we see is the witch's broom and all that sort of thing are, are, are just sections uh, within it it's a it's, it's quite a remarkable um little image this one i rather like it yeah, yeah it's hard to visualize those objects as 3d but now uh, that's most impressive yeah yeah particularly up P pickering's triangle there that uh that really really puts it in perspective yeah uh, it does doesn't it yeah Right, folks, um, time's going on. Um, perhaps I'll just finish up with uh, some pictures that we took uh, last night. Just whiz through these. Um, so that was uh, last night's Jupiter imaging session. Um, if you remember, the red spot was just coming around. This was at uh, 12 minutes past eight. Um, and 45 minutes later, you can see how far up the red spot has traversed. Uh, the shadow transit of Europa, that wasn't last night, that was a few nights ago. Um, that was the best image of Saturn I've had so far this year. Um, this was the image we got of Saturn last night. Um, it was rather low down in the sky when we started imaging. I hope the picture we took tonight will uh, look a bit better than that. Here is uh, Neptune last night. If you remember, Triton was down here, and tonight it's, it's up here. Um, this is our stack of 10 30-second exposures of uh, globulus cluster M15. Um, and I mentioned the blue stars. If you take a longer exposure like this, you can see all these beautiful blue RR Lyri stars around the periphery of it. So that is a binocular object. You can see that as a shiny misty patch um, with a pair of binoculars. Um, this is the dear lit galaxy we imaged last night. Again, it's a live stack of 10 by 30 second frames, showing the little companion galaxies uh, around it, about 30 million light years distance. Now, when this, uh, we couldn't see this at the time, Mike showed you a picture of the, the crab. Um, I got a picture of the crab last night as it rose above uh, the trees on my eastern boundary. Um, this actually does show the little pulsar, little pair of stars in here. The lower one is the pulsar, which uh, is a neutron star spinning rapidly about 30 times per second. Um, uh, Justin Bell Burnell described the best way to describe that star, or the density of it, is to take a thimble and put all humanity in that thimble, that seven billion of us, that would be equivalent to the weight of a, a thimble full of that stellar material. Um, what else is happening in the sky? We have an outbursting comet. Uh, the comet goes by this unpronounceable name, Comet 29P Schwachmann Wachmann has brightened and expanded remarkably over the past week. You might remember Comet Holmes, um, very remote comet, did the same sort of thing. It's not quite as spectacular as Comet Holmes, but it's certainly increased in size. Um, 29P orbits beyond the orbit of Jupiter. It never comes near to the sun. 
it's a circular orbit. Um, so we're not quite sure the me mechanics, what causes these um, eruptions, causing it to outgas like this. Um, certainly it's not, uh, of course, when a comet gets near the sun, the heat melts all the, the water ice, the volatiles in a comet, and a tail begins to form. But um, that generally happens when you come across the orbit of Mars. As I say, this comet is beyond the orbit of Jupiter, so there's no heat source um, that's heating it, causing this coma to expand. So we're eagerly imaging this, and we're watching it expand um, from night to night. Um, this was a galaxy that we hope to show you, but it was behind the trees last night. It's an edge-on galaxy seen about 30 million light years distance. About the same size of our own galaxy, about 120,000 light years um, in diameter. And you can see here Patrick Moore's very apt description of a galaxy. He said, galaxies are like two fried eggs laid back to back. And you can see why. Sun is waking up. We've come through the solar minimum. Um, and this was a sunspot right on the centre of the disk of the sun on 11th of October. This was taken with a special hydrogen alpha telescope. Uh, and this particular sunspot gave us a coronal mass ejection. And there have been reports of aurora over the next, over the last few nights, particularly in Scotland. But I don't think they've come um, this far south. But you never know. Keep a lookout for aurora. Um, and aurora, of course, are the lovely blue, sometimes red uh, cast you see in the sky that ripple. Um, this one was taken from Iceland a few years ago. But they are beautiful things to look at. Um, and you certainly will see a lot of them in, in Scotland and the in, in North Polar regions. So I think we will end it there. Thank you all, everybody, for uh, 